the situation then is, uh, in an individual patient sitting in the room, as I said, I tend to put them in different categories. So what I am showing you on the next few slides is how I would rank order the available therapies if you happen to be antibody negative for the JC virus, so at very, very low risk for PML, and also have an average risk of disability. So you're not the benign MS group, you're in that middle group. In that situation, in my own practice, I would probably uh, recommend Cesabri as a first line agent, because outside of PML, its risk of having another serious uh, side effect in you is very low. It's in the range of maybe one in 20,000 or less. So, uh, it's also one of the most effective therapies we have. So the risk-benefit ratio is actually very high for patients in this particular category. Rituximab as an off-label drug might be a possibility. The problem with this drug is it's not going to be covered by insurance and it's very expensive. So in fact, we're substantially limited in how we can use it. In the future, if BG12 were available today, it would probably be third on my list. And then for Copaxone, there's a genetic test coming out to identify super responders. And if that test continues to be valid in this current test, it may be that Copaxone will remain in this top tier of this group for patients who are positive on that blood test. Then we get into other therapies. Now, the reason teraflunamide, which is an oral agent that's in process of being approved, is above Rebif, Avnex, and uh, Delaney in this group is because the Rebif and Avnex and uh, beta strong and Xtavia are injectable drugs. They have a bit more in the way of acute side effects in terms of flu-like symptoms but their level of efficacy is the same as terafalunamide. So overall, the risk-benefit ratio of terafalunamide with the interferons is about the same, but it's easier to use because it's a pill you take once a day. Now, whether that will hold up or not depends on whether we run into additional safety problems as the drug is used in more and more patients. The reason alentuzumab is at the bottom is because it's a very effective drug, but it has a high risk of developing other autoimmune diseases. And uh, as a result, it's not a very attractive uh, population in my mind for this patient population. However, if you're in the high risk of disability group and you're antibody negative, Tisabra remains the top, but now Gelenia and Alentuzumab move up because these drugs have high levels of efficacy, and this is a situation where taking on a bit more risk might be uh, reasonable. Also, compared to your printouts, there's a change in that teraflunamide also moved up in my thinking over the last couple of days as I was uh, considering this talk. However, if you're JCD antibody positive, Tisabri goes to the bottom, particularly if you've been exposed to chemotherapies in the past. And the reason is, is that if you're antibody positive and you're on Tisabri for three years or longer, your risk of having PML is about 1 in 300 to 1 in 500. And if you've had chemotherapy exposure in the past for anything, your risk is as high as 1 in 80. That's a very high risk of a disease that most likely will kill you or leave you completely disabled. So as a result, there's a very different profile here. Rituximab, actually right now in my mind, would be the most attractive therapy there. The problem again is off-label use. BG12, Copaxone for the genetically um, uh, super responders, Gelania and teraflunamide would make up the top list for the rest of them. It may be that there are patients that could benefit similarly from interferons, but we don't yet have biomarkers to identify who they are. Plus the interferons are plagued by neutralizing antibodies, which makes it hard to know an individual patient whether they're really working or not, and that's why they're ranked lower. Alentuzumab would be a possibility here, particularly if you, if you had failed rituximab and couldn't get access to it. But again, because of its safety profile, uh, I've ranked it relatively low. If you're JCD antibody positive and high risk of disability, though, alentuzumab moves up in the list substantially, and it may be an appropriate uh, therapy for patients like that. To Savory, even though you still have a risk of PML, if you did not have chemotherapy exposure, would also be a consideration if you were uh, willing to accept that risk. And we have patients who actually do that. But if you're chemo exposed, again, I probably would not use this therapy because the risk is just too high. We are doing additional studies at the center to try to identify better ways of identifying the you know, 399 people out of 400 who don't get PML who are in this category. And hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have some better assays that will help us refine that risk further. There is a special case, and this is for young women who are thinking about pregnancy. All the other drugs except for Copaxone are class C or class X for pregnancy, which means class C means they can have definite adverse effects, and it's up to the physician and patient to decide whether they want to accept them. Class X means they're absolutely contraindicated and should not be used, uh, and particularly during conception. The most important time is the first six weeks after conception for these drugs.
Copaxone is a class B drug. There's no evidence it has any negative effects on pregnancy or breastfeeding, either from the animal models or from human studies. But we have not done formal studies in pregnancy, therefore it's not a class A drug. Nevertheless, about half of our patients in our clinic will stay on Copaxone during pregnancy and postpartum in order to minimize the risk of relapse. There are, is literature coming out on the consequences of pregnancy while people are on Tosavri, the interferons, and BG12. And in general, most of the pregnancies are successful, but these drugs are known to have negative effects on pregnancy, and in our recommendations would be better for you to be off these therapies prior to conceiving and during pregnancy. There are other issues to consider, as I mentioned, in safety monitoring for Tosavri. We would do a baseline MRI. We would see you every three months, at least in the first year. If you're JCV antibody negative, then in the second year you're doing well and you don't really have issues that you want to talk with us about, then we might move to once every six months. We would recommend having liver enzymes tested every three to six months, although this is not a major problem. The most important thing about Tosavri is we need to do an MRI if you develop any new neurological symptoms. We have to assume that it may be PML. It's important that we rule it out as soon as possible. So for patients on Tosavri, I don't personally do annual MRIs. One reason is, is I'm afraid of getting denied by insurance if I come back and they need to do an urgent MRI. Uh, but also the MRI by and large is not changing unless you have symptoms going on. Nevertheless, I can't emphasize enough that I feel strongly that if people are on Tosavri and they develop a new neurological symptom, they need to have an urgent MRI to rule out uh, PML. In the case of Jelenia, uh, as you probably know, you go on this drug, you need to be monitored for the first six hours on their first dose, primarily to look for cardiac effects. And if the drug slows down their heart too much or drops the blood pressure too much, they may need to be admitted to the hospital and watched overnight. Again, we would monitor people every three months for safety and uh, first year. And then if they're doing well, hospital go to us every six months if they have no other medical issues in the second year. I feel strongly that we need to monitor the CBC and liver function tests every three months. You need to have an OCT done after your first three-month visit, which is an imaging study of the eye to make sure you don't have swelling of the retina. And uh, this one is a question of whether you would do annual MRIs because it's not as effective as Tosabri and Rituximab, and there may be a role for using MRI monitoring with this drug. Fralentuzumab, which is a new monoclonal antibody that's very powerful. Uh, this is an example of a, of a therapy that has high levels of effect but requires very close monitoring. This drug can induce a number of autoimmune diseases that can attack your clotting mechanisms or your bone marrow or your kidneys. And as a result, you need to have monthly blood tests and you need to make sure that they are seen by your physician and evaluated. Um, outside of that, it's a highly effective therapy and it involves five infusions uh, for one week in the first year, three infusions over one week in the second year. So you're only really treated once a year with this particular therapy. For the interferons, BG12 and terfalunamide, uh, this, these drugs have less in the way of major safety issues. Probably should still be monitored fairly regularly during the first year, but there's not a, a need for the Q3 month monitoring that we currently use. However, these therapies are substantially less effective than some of the other ones I've mentioned. And I personally would use MRI on an annual basis, particularly in the first few years, to make sure that we're really shutting off the disease as completely as possible. So, Copaxone, there's no blood test, and basically we just use the MRI to make sure that it's working as well as it should. So at this point, I would say that uh, I would recommend that you talk with your neurologist about what your therapeutic goals are, and I would urge you to consider that if you continue to have a relapse on a once a year or once every other year basis, that from our perspective, that's having average MS, and you can probably do better by adjusting your therapy. I would also recommend that even if you are doing well, that you discuss with your neurologist on an annual basis uh, what your treatment options are to see whether it's really the best. And I would keep in mind that the best may have to do not just with how well it works, but how much it costs you, how much side effects it costs, etc. 